Well, thank you, Josh, and it is a tremendous honor for me to be here, and, and I want to let you know how much I respect uh, Pastor John McDermott and his wife and the tremendous work, and uh, uh, join me in thanking the Lord for such a great leader right here in Lawrence, Kansas. And a good friend, Chris Kobach, and I've known Chris for about 20 years, and I'm like, you should be senator, you should be governor, you should be. Uh, so uh, just thank you, Chris, for coming out today and, uh, and for your leadership in America. I do want to mention a few books I have on the back. Um, one is called Miracles in American History. Uh, my wife's heard me speak for 30 years, and she decided to pick out the best stories. And there's the one, the ones where there's a crisis, they pray, things turn around, Revolution, War of 1812, Civil War, Barbary Pirate War, inspiring stories. And um, then this afternoon, I'm going to speak on the book, Who is the King in America? And if I talk about it now, I won't talk about it then, but it's good. Um, <laughs> And then I'm going to speak this morning, uh, two sessions on the, the book Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present. By the way, uh, since DVDs are going out of style, we put all uh, my presentations on flash drives. A lot of times people say, oh, can I get your presentation? Well, so they're available on the back. So let me go ahead and jump into my presentation. I sent out a daily email called American Minute, and it's something that happened on each day. So my website's AmericanMinute.com. And then uh, Socialism. Title is... The Real History from Plato to the Present. Why Plato? Plato's the first one that talked about everybody owning everything in common. Sounds nice until you think it through. There's always somebody that's in the position of handing out all the common stuff. And they're always going to be tempted to give a little extra to their family and friends on the side. And hold back from someone they just don't like. And before you know it, it gets discretionary. And the saying is, he who holds the purse strings has the power. And so every attempt at everybody owning everything equally always ends up with a bureaucracy with the most corrupt politician on the top, a dictator. Um, well, let's go back to Plato. <clears throat> he lived in Athens, 380 BC, and he wrote about Atlantis, which existed supposedly 800 years before him. And Plato considered Atlantis the ideal structured society, right? So this is this really organized uh, civilization on an island in the Mediterranean, and um, it sinks in the sea. Now, whether or not it existed, he thought that it did. And there is an island in the Mediterranean called Santorini, and it's what's left of a volcano. And when it blew, it would have destroyed lots of civiliz civilizations across the Mediterranean. Uh, I went there in college. Um, it's now a really nice tourist, a Greek city on top of this ridge that used to be a volcano. Um, so Plato, he considered Atlantis the ideal structured society. Everybody say structured. He considered a democracy an unstructured society. Everybody say unstructured. So demos means people, crossy means rule. And so in a democracy, the people rule. And the chief characteristic of a democracy is tolerance. Everybody tolerates each other. It's wonderful. And then they begin to tolerate people that are a little bit off, and we'll see what happens. So he's, he writes, the state is like a bazaar at which you can buy anything, a piece of embroidery, the greatest variety of human natures. Such is democracy, a pleasing, lawless, various sort of government, a charming form of government, full of variety and disorder. And so then he says that this tolerate tolerance is begins to tolerate lawlessness and he says the manner of life is that of democrats now he's talking about a democracy every man does what is right in his own eyes and the father they tolerate disrespect in the home so the father gets accustomed to descend to the level of his son and fear him and the son having no shame or fear of his parents and then they tolerate disrespect in the classroom the teacher fears and flatters his students the students despise their masters and tutors and then they tolerate financial ir irresponsibility. And uh, they take money from the city treasury and spread it around. Now the treasury is empty. And then they decide to vote to take the money from the rich people. He says the leaders deprive the rich of their estates and distribute them amongst the people. And then they tolerate immorality in their personal behavior. Plato says the young man passes into freedom and libertinism of useless and unnecessary pleasures. There is no conceivable folly or crime, not accept, accepting incest or any other unnatural union. He is parted company with all shame. 
Yes, that's what he's talking about. <clears throat> Matter of fact, a study was done by an Oxford anthropologist, J.D. Unwin. He writes a book in 1934, and he looked at Athens as well as 80 major civilizations over 5,000 years of time, and he saw trends. And one of the trends was sexual promiscuity and loosening of sexual restraints always precedes civilizational collapse. And so he said these civilizations tend to go through four stages. The first is a period of pain and poverty. They go through war, they go through famine, and they make it through and they work hard. And they begin to work together. And so they become productive and patriotic. They're working together. And then finally, they succeed and they become prosperous. And then they want to enjoy their prosperity and they get pleasure-focused and then they get promiscuous, indulgent, undisciplined in the weekend, and they're conquered by the next rising civilization. It's sort of like an athlete. When he's young, he's focused and disciplined, watches his diet, he exercises, he wants that championship. And finally, he gets it, he wins, he's the champ for a couple seasons. And then he gets a little lazy, doesn't exercise as much, maybe eats some fatty foods, and in his mind, he still thinks he's the tough guy. And he gets challenged into the ring of competition and he gets the tar knocked out of him because in reality, he's a couch potato, right? And so that's the way these civilizations go. They're young, they're focused, they work hard, they're disciplined, and then finally they get to be the champs and then they get a little bit lazy. And uh, J.D. Unwin, he's not a Christian to my knowledge, he's just an Oxford anthropologist and he actually called it a sexual marketplace. He says, when women as a whole say nothing happens unless there's a commitment, the guys say, whatever it takes, they make the commitment, then they go out and work hard and be productive to provide for their wife. And then little kids appear, and the guy has a new emotion called being protective right, of his wife and family. And when all the men of the country are productive and protective, rising water floats all boats, the whole country becomes productive and protective and expansionistic and innovative and creative and even militaristic. But when the, when the women as a whole say there does not need to be a commitment, water seeks its own level and you'll have a bunch of guys saying, hey, pleasure time, and they get selfish and they get focused on their own pleasure and there's fewer kids born to fill the ranks of the military. And when enough of the men of the country do this, the country's weakened and they get conquered by the next rising civilization. And J.D. Unwin says it's irreversible. Once a civilization that he studies begins to go down this road, it, it never turns. It's like a snowball effect. Why? Because human nature wants the pleasure. And so we're faced with a situation to see if we can put the brakes on this. Now, um, John Adams writes to Thomas Jefferson. He says, have you ever found in history one single example of a nation thoroughly corrupted that was afterwards restored to virtue, and without virtue there can be no political liberty. Will you tell me how to prevent luxury from producing effeminacy, intoxication, extravagance, vice, folly? No effort in favor of virtue is lost. Harry S. Truman worded it this way, without a firm moral foundation, freedom degenerates quickly into selfishness and anarchy. And so back to Athens. Plato says they tolerate each other, it's wonderful, then they tolerate people that are a little bit off. Then they tolerate people that are a lot off. Till finally they're tolerating lawlessness. And it's chaos and there's random violence and looting and smashing windows and rioting. And, and when all this chaos happens, the people begin to say, can't someone come along and fix this mess? And that's when you have some governor that comes along and says, I can fix it. I just need some emergency powers. Just temporarily. And uh, he says, last of all comes the tyrant. When he first appears above ground, he's a protector. He's full of smiles, right? Everybody likes him. But then he begins to consolidate power. And if any are suspected of resistance to his authority, he'll have a good pretext for destroying them. And then Plato says, how does this protector turn into the tyrant? He says, he begins to grow unpopular. So tyrants have two tools in their toolbox. Fraud and force. Fraud is they'll lie to you and take away your freedoms, telling you that they're doing it for your good. But when people begin to see through that, 
and say, wait a second, you're turning yourself into a dictator. They cast it in his teeth, and he has a choice, give up the power, which he's not inclined to do because Plato called him a lover of power, or get rid of the people confronting him. So he purges his administration and military of anybody with virtue. All he wants is yes men. And so uh, Plato says that uh, standing up in the chariot of state with the reins in his hand, a tyrant absolute. And having a mob entirely at his disposal, he's not restrained from shedding of blood. And so this is Plato talking about that democracies and republics without the people having morals and virtue turns into lawlessness and chaos out of which people want someone to come along and fix it and the rubber band snaps back into the hands of a tyrant. And Plato says that democracy is doomed to fail because it's based on the people having virtue. But if you give people a choice of giving up their life or giving up their virtue, they'll always give up their virtue to save their life. Now, ancient Israel's attempt to rule themselves without a king lasted a little longer because they had a big magnet in the sky called God. And everybody was virtuous because they were accountable to this God. Athens did not have that. By Plato's time, Athens had a bunch of fickle deities that nobody believed in anyway. And so Plato says, you know, this virtue thing, it's only going to last until people give in to their selfish nature. It's going to turn into lawlessness, and then we're going to be back to a dictator. Matter of fact, Plato said, if someone was born that truly had virtue, the world would crucify him. He writes this in 380 B.C. If a truly just man lived, let him die as he lived. I might add that the just man will be scourged, rack bound, and will at last be crucified. So Plato said that because democracy is doomed to fail, the best you can hope for is a nice tyrant. He called him a philosopher king. Now let's give him the benefit of the, of the doubt. Let's say there is such a thing as a nice tyrant. He doesn't live forever. And at some point, he's going to have to hand all this concentrated power over to some son or grandson that is not a good ruler and uses it oppressively. What's the Bible example? Joseph in Egypt, a godly man, concentrates power into the hands of the Pharaoh. But what did that Pharaoh do with the concentrated power? He fed the children of Israel, gave them the best land to Goshen, gave them jobs taking care of his cattle. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And he used all that concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and throw their sons in the Nile River. That's the dilemma. We get our guy in, and we say, okay, it's okay for him to usurp a little power, right, because he's on our side. But then he hands that all over to the other side, and they use all that concentrated power to oppress people. Anyway, so Plato says that this tyrant, this philosopher king, is the head of gold, and his administrators and military, his deep state, are the arms and chest of silver. They get special treatment because they're keeping everything organized, and it's better than a democracy that ends in chaos. And so they're the ruling class. And then everyone else is the abdomen of iron and bronze. They are the ruled class. So socialism, going back to Plato, is a two-tiered society of a ruling class and a ruled class. Now, the ruling class, they're above the law, they're politically connected, they're supported by the commoners. They can do special things, like getting their hair styled when nobody else can. I remember Nancy Pelosi, that did. anyway. Now, the ruled class, yes, everyone is provided for, but nobody owns anything. Everything's held in common, and it's the ruling class that decides who gets what. Right? The saying is, he who holds the purse strings has the power. Now, in Plato's Republic, he's talking about this ideal society. There are no families. The government decides who gets to have children. And the government takes the children away from the parents and brings them into the schools where they're socialized, which is a process of using peer pressure to get them to give up their family's beliefs and just learn how to serve the ruling class. And so he says, when the true philosopher kings are born in a state, they will set in order their own city. They will take possession of the children who will be unaffected by the habits of their parents. These they will train in their own habits and laws. And then these children will, will be brought into the city of Athens and taught lies, noble lies. 
But the lies help the tyrant to stay in power, and since he's better than a democracy, uh, so Plato says, we want one single grand lie, which will be believed by everybody. Could you imagine the government taking the kids away from the families and teaching them lies? And hmm. Anyway, so Plato's perfect structured society on the island of Atlantis inspired Sir Thomas More's Island of Utopia, written in 1516, shortly after Columbus discovered the New World. And these scholars in Europe are like fascinated that they get an opportunity to set up new societies. And so Sir Thomas More uh, writes this, and the word utopia means nowhere. It's a fictitious island off the coast of South America, supposedly discovered by Amerigo Vespucci. And it's written as a dialogue, which is the way Plato wrote. It's a conversation between two people. And the conversation is with a traveler named Hythlodeus, which means peddler of nonsense. So we have the island of nowhere, told to, told to us by the peddler of nonsense. And on this utopia, it is perfectly structured. There is an upper class rulers and lower class commoners. There's free health care. There's free identical clothing. Everyone receives free welfare, free meals in monastic communal dining halls. Everyone lives in free, identical, three-story public housing. There's no locks on any doors. There's no private property. All property and goods are stored in a communal warehouse with the ruling class deciding who gets what. There's no taverns, no alehouses, no coffee houses, no places for private gatherings. There's no privacy on Utopia. Everyone is tracked everywhere you go with an internal passport. If you're caught without it, it's a life of slavery. This is 1516. He's talking about everybody being tracked. The government decides everyone's careers. There are no families on Sir Thomas More's Utopia. Uh, the childbearing is regulated by the government, very similar to China's one-child policy or Planned Parenthood's Margaret Sanger, who said, no woman shall have a legal right to bear a child without a permit. Now, Sir Thomas More was writing this as a veiled criticism of Henry VIII. He's the king that took England from being Catholic to Anglican, and he insisted all of his staff immediately switch with him. And Sir Thomas More didn't, and so he was criticizing Henry as wanting to control everybody's beliefs. And Henry VIII had Sir Thomas More killed. And uh, anyway, this inspired Sir Francis Bacon, who wrote New Atlantis. He names his work New Atlantis because he's directly referring to Plato's Atlantis. And Sir Francis Bacon lived during the Scientific Revolution, and so... The island is in the South Pacific, a fictitious island, and it's highly structured. There's a ruling class, commoners, a little more scientific careers, but the government controls everything. Someone wrote a satire on this, and you've read it. Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver means gullible traveler. And here he is washed up on an island of Lilliput and finds out it's highly structured, with this ruling class that controls every minutia of everybody's lives, and then the ruling class that just has to work their jobs. Why is this important? Well, it was during this time that the pilgrims come to America. The pilgrims had no money, so they go to investors in England who formed the London Company to finance these pilgrims, and they're wanting to get a profit out of this endeavor. And so the writers of the bylaws of the London Company look back to Plato and Sir Thomas More to begin to come up with this idea of everybody owning everything in common. So the Pilgrim Company bylaws say this, all profits and benefits that are got by trade, traffic, trucking, working, fishing, or any other means shall remain still in ye common stock. And all are to have their meat, drink, and apparel and all provision out of ye common stock. William Bradford says they tried it and almost starved to death. Uh, he says that the failure of that experiment of communal service, which was tried for several years by good and honest men, proves the emptiness of the theory of Plato and other ancients applauded by some of latter times. I just think this is amazing. Here's the pilgrim governor, William Bradford, 
knowing that they were trying to live out Plato's perfect society. Prior to the pilgrims, everything was theoretical. A bunch of guys around a table say, okay, how do we, hey, I got an idea. Let's have everybody own everything in common. Hey, it's just theoretical. The pilgrims are the first people that actually try to live this out. Bradford says that the taking away of private property and possession of it in community would make a state happy and flourishing, as if they were wiser than God. For in this instance, community of property was found to breed much confusion and discontent, retard much employment, which would have been to the general benefit. For the young men who were most able and fit for service objected to being forced to spend their time and strength in working for other men's wives and children without any recompense. The strong man or the resourceful man had no more share of food, clothes, etc. than the weak man who was not able to do a quarter what the other could. This was thought injustice. The aged and graver men who were ranked and equalized in labor, food, clothes, etc. with the humbler and younger ones thought it some indignity and disrespect to them. As for men's wives who were obliged to do service for other men, such as cooking, washing their clothes, etc., they considered it a kind of slavery. And many husbands would not brook it or allow it. Bradford goes on, Let none argue that this is due to human failing rather than to this communistic plan of life in itself. I answer that God, in his wisdom, saw that another plan of life was fitter for them. So they began to consider how to raise more corn, obtain a better crop, so they might not continue to endure the misery of want. After much debate, the governor with the chief among them allowed each man to plant corn for his own household. Wow, what a novel idea. (laughs) So every family was assigned a parcel of land. This was very successful. It made all hands very industrious so that much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any other means and gave far better satisfaction. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to plant corn. While before they would allege weakness and inability and to have compelled them would have been thought great oppression. So here we have the pilgrims, right? Taking this theoretical thing and trying to live it out and they almost starve to death, they scrap it, they give everybody their own plot of land. Now wasn't the early church socialist? No, actually the early church was the early church. Socialism is counterfeit early church. And the difference is between the words voluntary and involuntary and church and government. So the early believers voluntarily sold their land and voluntarily laid the money at the feet of the apostles for the church to distribute. They didn't have their land taken away and then being forced to involuntarily put the money at the feet of Pilate for the Roman government to redistribute. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, every family was given property. If you own property, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. And you can be moved upon in your heart to voluntarily give away some of your stuff. The Bible called that charity. Lenin said socialism is a transition phase from capitalism to communism. And Karl Marx says communism can be summed up in one sentence, abolition of private property. If you don't own anything, how can you be charitable? How can you give away what you do not have? What, are you going to steal from somebody, break the law, and now you're a thief? No, God entrusts you with stuff, and you have the opportunity to voluntarily manifest in this physical world what spiritually is in your heart, the love of God. And this is sort of a big deal with God, right? He makes everything, and everything follows rules, laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of physics. At some point, God said, you know, I can make things that obey me. I would like to create something with a, with a free will, right? And so the reason that he made us is because we have the free will to choose God and not. And he says that we get to show our love for God by loving our neighbor. What about Jesus? Wasn't he a socialist? Well, let's look at his parable. Uh, One guy gets five talents, multiplies it to 10. A a talent was a weight of money or gold. Uh, Another guy gets two talents, multiplies it to four, and then one buries his talent. And he says, sir, here's your talent. I've kept it away in a piece of cloth. His master replied, you wicked servant. 
He said to those standing by, take his talent away from him and give it to the one who has ten. Sir, they said, he already has ten. Hereby I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but to the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. If Jesus were a socialist, he would have said, take from that guy that's got ten and distribute them equally. But no, it's the proverb, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. Right? God doesn't bless laziness. If you're just going to do nothing, bury it, give it to, at least to somebody that's going to do something and, and multiply it and make a, make a difference in the world. There's a confusion as to the role of government. In the Bible, God clearly gives commands to five groups. Individuals, families, business, church, and government. Individuals, among other things, are commanded to take care of the poor. Family commands are mostly relational. Husbands love your wives, children submit to your parents. Business commands are mostly do an honest day's work and don't hold back wages. The church definitely has commands to take care of the poor. And they immediately did, beginning to feed orphans and widows and through the years started hospitals and medical clinics and started dug wells and villages. Did you know there's no command for the government to take care of the poor? The command to the government's the shortest. Protect the innocent, punish the guilty. There's no command for the government to be involved in health care. There's no command for the government to be involved in education. What's happened is the government has usurped the church's role. James Madison, the chief architect of the Constitution, says charity is no part of the legislative duty of the government. Davy Crockett, he was a congressman and uh, before he dies in the Alamo, and he, there was a fire in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. area, and Congress was going to vote to take some of their tax money that they would collected and bail out the people of Georgetown, and Davy Crockett said no. He says, Congress, ha Congress has not the power to appropriate this money as an act of charity. Every member on the floor knows it. We have the right as individuals to give away as much of our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no right to appropriate a dollar of the public money as charity. Calvin Coolidge says, it does not follow that because something ought to be done, the national government ought to do it. We need to take, we need to take care of the poor. Yes, we do, but it's not the government's job. We need to take care of the immigrant. Yes, we do, but it's not the government's job. We need to take care of the sick. We need to educate. We need to do, we need to do all those things, but it's not the government's job. And historically... You look at America, as soon as we became a nation, right, in the early 1800s, as what, there's what's called the Second Great Awakening Revival. And you had preachers like Charles Finney, who said, being a Christian is more than going to church and hearing sermons. you got to do something. And his lectures on revival influenced William and Catherine Booth to do something, and they started the Salvation Army. And his lectures on revival, revival influenced George Williams to start the YMCA. And this movement started across America where you had abolitionist societies getting started. And, you know, temperance movements and women's suffrage movements. And it was all Clara Barton, a school teacher. And she, she starts the American Red Cross. I mean, these are individuals starting things without the government. It was only during FDR's period that you began to have the government with the New Deal begin to get involved. First, they were raising money, right, to give to the Red Cross. They, okay, everybody donate to the Red Cross, you know, but then they began to, under FDR, take over these public assistance things. And then you have the dilemma, right? Whenever the government runs anything, the person in the government doing the running likes their job, and they're going to be tempted to want to funnel a little extra uh, to their family and friends and, you know, loosen the regulations and help push things through for their family and friends. And then the people they don't like, they want to tax them and take away their money. Gerald Ford says, people say, why don't you expand that program and spend more federal money? I look them in the eye and say, do you realize that a government big enough to give us everything we want is a government big enough to take from us everything we have? What if, what if older fish could tell younger fish to stay away from shiny things dangling in the water. <laughs> but they can't. So every new generation of younger fish sees this shiny thing, and they're attracted to it and caught. Socialism is a shiny thing dangling in the water. 
Free food, free clothes, free education, free welfare. Free is attractive. But there's a hook there. You're giving up control of your life. You're giving up your independence. Now, whenever the church helps anybody, it is called disinterested benevolence. You're helping them for no other reason than just to help them. And hopefully they'll get better off and help the next needy person that comes along. Right? And then the body of Christ can grow. Whenever the government helps anybody, it's always in exchange for something. Right? You're in Egypt, you need food, the government will give you food, but it's in exchange for your cattle, your land, your children, your lives, your soul, your votes. When the church helps, it is always personal. The giver feels the joy of the Lord, of God using them to meet someone's need. And the recipient feels the love of God from a real person. And they're grateful and a relationship starts and a, they have love and it begins to knit, knit together the body of Christ. Whenever the government helps anybody, it is always impersonal. You don't know whose pocket that money was taken out of that turned into that welfare check that came in the mail. And you don't care. And the recipient, instead of being grateful, views it as a debt that is owed to them and they get irate if it's discontinued. And then an interesting phenomenon. The, re the recipient over time begins to lose self-esteem. And they began to see other people being successful and they know in the back that they're just getting this free stuff. And, and they have this negative feeling that they want to channel somewhere. They want, they want to blame someone. They end up blaming the very government giving them free stuff. They end up hating the very government that's giving them free stuff. It's an unusual dynamic. Now the pilgrims. They go from company to covenant. What's that? From involuntary to voluntary. Instead of the bylaws saying, we're going to take away stuff and then we're going to distribute it, it's no, you get your stuff and you have the voluntary opportunity to take care of those in need. So instead of those in need being taken care of because of this government structure, they're being taken care of because you are voluntarily yielding to the love of God. So this is called a covenant form of government, which the Puritans and pilgrims got from ancient Israel. And it's like a triangle. You get rights and blessings from God and you voluntarily take care of your neighbor because you are doing it as unto God. Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you're doing unto me. It's voluntary. Margaret Sanger says, the Decalogue, Ten Commandments, are addressed to each and every person. This is the origin of our common humanity, the sanctity of the individual. Your founding fathers came over with that. They looked after one another, not only as a matter of necessity, but as a matter of duty to their God. There is no other country on earth which started that way. So here, instead of your, your neighbor's being taken care of because the state's redistributing it, your neighbor's being taken care of because you are a religious person and you're doing it as unto God. The, I'm going to speak more on this this afternoon. But this idea of our government having a covenant form goes back to the pilgrims. The word Mayflower, compact. The word compact means covenant. You know, the Virginia Commonwealth, the Massachusetts Commonwealth. Commonwealth meant covenant. And they got this from ancient Israel so much so that they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. I mean, this is Yale's coat of arms. And it's got Hebrew characters on it, right? Truth and light. So, um, again, more on this afternoon, but ancient Israel, when they come out of Egypt around 1400 BC, for 400 years, they do not have a king. And I've spent several years researching every civilization that's ever existed on planet Earth. Sumerian cuneiform and the Elamites, the Persians, and then the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the 2000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. And then you got Darius and Cyrus of Persia and Alexander the Great. The, it's, it's all empires. And they keep growing bigger because with military advancements and technological advancements, the king can kill and track more people. And until finally the king of England had the biggest, and the sun never set on the British Empire, America's founders broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. But the America's founders got their idea from these colonial New England pastors that got their idea from the Bible, that got their idea from that part of the Bible, that first 400-year period when Israel came out of Egypt before they got King Saul. The total anomaly in world history that you have a nation with millions of people and there is no king. 
And it worked because every single citizen was taught the law and then personally accountable to God to follow the law. And um, so if you think of government power as a spectrum, as a line, one side is total government, the other side is no government. Total government, you get a king who rules through fear. All governments, sultans, czars, kaisers, they all rule through fear. You do what they say or they end up killing you. Uh, No government side of the spectrum. That would be chaos. No government anarchy unless each person was taught the law. And I was trying to find a way of explaining this. Imagine if, um, if everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. Instead of a GPS app telling you where to turn left 50 yards ahead, imagine a behavioral app that tells you how to act in real time. Right? It's sensing your blood pressure. You're about to lose it. And, and it says, uh, don't, don't yell at that person. And then it, it checks your bank account and sees you hanging around a little bit extra with something valuable. And there's nobody in the vicinity. And it runs this algorithm that you're being tempted to steal. And it says, alert, alert, don't steal. So imagine an app that tells you how to act in real time. That's what the law is. Right? So in ancient Israel, the Levites were the computer geeks that help you to download this app. Right? You go to Apple Store and Google Play and line up online line precept. And so they, everybody was taught the law in ancient Israel. But the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Ancient Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who is watching everyone. He wants you to be fair. He's going to hold you accountable in the future. You're about to steal. Nobody's around. You know you can get away with it. And then you think, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country really believes this stuff, you can maintain complete order, safety, security. You don't have to lock the door. Women can go anywhere without fear because everybody believes that God is watching them, wants them to be fair, is going to hold them accountable in the future. And... um, now, God knew the Israelites would sin, so uh, once a year they would sacrifice the uh, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and everybody's sins were forgiven for the past year, and they start off the new year with a clean slate, and this is foreshadowing Jesus, the permanent atonement. He died once to cleanse us of our sins. Reagan says, without God, there's no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. If there's no God, laws are just things made up by a bunch of old men. Why follow them? And it winds up to whoever has the biggest army forces the other one to follow him. So if you get rid of God, all you have is a bunch of laws, and the motivation to follow the laws disappears, and then it turns into chaos and lawlessness. And then when there's lawless, like Plato talked about, then they want some governor to come along and fix it, and that's when the rubber band snaps back. So let's look at ancient Israel. Their system worked, but then the priests stopped teaching the law. And Eli, the high priest, his own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And uh, then you have um, a Levite with a graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. And the tribe of Dan comes along and takes the graven image. And um, you're reading the story. It's like, what's this Levite doing with a graven image? Isn't it one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have them. And then there's a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the woman he's not even married to. And they're in a house. And the Bible says there's, the house is surrounded by sodomites that, that bang on the door and rape the poor girl to death. Right? Remember? J.D. Unwin said sexual promiscuity always precedes the collapse. And and so it turns into such chaos that they all go to Samuel the prophet. And uh, there's this line in the Bible, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. The same line that 600 years later uh, uh, in Athens, Plato used. And so it turns into this unstructured chaos. And that's when they all go to Samuel the prophet. And they say this self-government system is no longer working. We don't have any more virtue. Um, We want a king. And Samuel cries, And the Lord tells them, they have not rejected thee, but they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So it turns into this chaos, and they get King Saul. Now, a story, King Saul is pouting that his son Jonathan became friends with David, and he turns to his soldiers, none of you soldiers care about me. And the one soldier, Doeg the Edomite, said, King, I care. I saw David go to this town. The priest gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath that was stored there. And Saul turns to his soldiers and... and, and, um, says, bring those priests to me. The priests show up, and he tells his men, he goes, kill them. And the, the soldiers hesitate, and Doeg the Edomite goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system. 
where each individual is accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn someone to death. There's only one witness, Doeg. So they're like, okay, you're telling me to kill, and I'm personally accountable to God, and the law says there need to be two. There's only one. They still have a con- They're hesitating. They still have a conscience. Doeg the Edomite says, king, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. Tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. You tell me there's no more male and female, tell me that whatever you tell me, government, I'm just a bunch of bush. When you blow your trumpet, I'll bow to your statue. I'm, there's, right? Dictators always want to insert themselves between you and God. They want to dictate to you. They want to burn you at the stake unless you believe exactly what they tell you. The state always wants to conform your beliefs. And God's jealous. He doesn't want the state in between you and him. Right? So now... This pilgrim form of government, this Puritan, this covenant, I'm going to go through four slides and explain the transition. So pilgrims, right, came over 1620. Well, the next century, covenant turned into social contract with an impersonal God during the Age of Enlightenment. This comes out of the scientific revolution where you have, you know, Kepler discovering laws of planetary motion, Isaac Newton discovering laws of gravity, laws of optics. Robert Boyle discovering laws of pressure. And so some theologians said, gee, uh, maybe God made everything with laws. And like a guy makes a complicated clock with gears and winds it up and sets it on a shelf. Maybe God has created everything, but it's just running on its own and, and he's off doing something else. And so if God exists, he's distant He's impersonal. He's not involved in our daily life. The ultimate of this is God is an impersonal force in the universe, like Spinoza or whatever. Well, you go from pilgrim covenant with a personal God to the Age of Enlightenment social contract with a distant God to the next century, it's French Revolution with no God. You get your rights from the group, you're accountable to the group, and the next century it turns into Marxism and socialism where the state is God. And uh, so let's go through this. So they got the French Revolution. Uh, You know, France helped us during our revolution. And you know what they got in return? Nothing but debt, lots of debt. And then their crops failed. And they remember they went to Queen Marie Antoinette and they say, the people don't have bread. And she supposedly said, let them eat cake, right? Wasn't her fault. Anyway, the people of France says, if we can just chop off the king and queen's heads, all of our problems will be solved. Well, they chop them off, it doesn't get any better. And then they chop off the heads of all the royalty, it doesn't get any better. Then they chop off the heads of the wealthy, you have money, we don't, you're selfish. Then they chop off the heads of the businessmen and farmers, you got food and supplies, we don't, you're selfish. Then they chop off the heads of the the hoarders, you got extra food, we don't have enough, you're selfish. Then they chop off the heads of the clergy, because they're speaking out against all the head chopping off stuff. Then they chop off the heads of the former revolutionaries, the ones that used to chop off heads but got tired of it. Somehow they're to blame. I mean, they were chopping off so many heads, they had to create a machine called the guillotine, nice and clean, right? And so 30,000 people had their heads chopped off in Paris, France. You know what the motto of the French Revolution was? Liberty, equality, fraternity. Sounds really nice, except it's mutually exclusive. It doesn't work. Why? Liberty is experienced individually. Fraternity is their word for socialism. It's the club, the collective, the state, the mob. And equality can be understood two ways. In America, it was equal treatment before the law. In France, it was everyone having an equal amount of stuff, equity. And if the fraternity, the group, the collective, the mob, thinks you have too much stuff, it can trample your individual liberty, take away all your stuff, redistribute it, put you in jail, and kill you. While this French Revolution is going on, the president of Yale is Timothy Dwight. He gives an address. Americans are sort of like freaking out. We thought, what's going on in France? And he gives the history. Prior to our revolution, there's a Great Awakening revival, but prior to the French Revolution, this is about the year 1728, Voltaire, so celebrated for his wit and his hatred of Christianity, formed a systematical design to destroy Christianity and to introduce in its stead a general diffusion of irreligion and atheism. The being of God was denied and ridiculed. Possession of property was pronounced robbery. You, got, you must have taken that from somebody. Chastity, natural affection were, deci- were de- um, declared to be nothing more than groundless prejudices. Right? Sort of like 
J.D. Unwin, right? Got this sexual promiscuity going on. Adultery, assassination, poisonings, and crimes of other in, uh, infernal nature were taught as lawful, provided the end was good. So it's okay for you to smash windows and beat up innocent people if you're pushing your political agenda. The education of youth, books replete with infidelity, irreligion, immorality, and obscenity. So now we're back to the kids. Remember, Plato wanted to take the kids away from the parents. And um, to destroy us, therefore, our enemies must first destroy our Sabbath and seduce us from the house of God. Once we get rid of there's no God left, then it's just us, and then it turns into this mob. So during France, they had what's called the Reign of Terror, and they tore down statues, like the statue of good King Henry IV. They even dug up the bones of St. Genevieve and trashed them. Who was she? Well, 450 A.D., Attila the Hun is scourging Europe with a half a million soldiers, wiping out city after city. And Genevieve gets all of Paris to fast and pray, and Attila skips sacking Paris. So she's the patron saint of Paris. Well, during the French Revolution, they dig up her bones and trash them. Why do you want to get rid of statues in history? It's something called deconstruction. And uh, every conquering country does it, where you portray the occupied countries past negatively so that people emotionally detach from it. And then you get them into a neutral, open-minded period. And then you portray whatever future you have planned for them positively. It's a sales technique. So if I was a toothpaste salesman, the first thing I do is tell you negative things about the toothpaste you're currently using. You're still brushing with that old stuff. Haven't you read it'll eat the enamel off your teeth? Ooh, you're repulsed by it. Now I have you in a neutral, you're open-minded. What are all the toothpastes out there? Then I give you my pitch for this brand new tartar control breath freshener toothpaste. Right? So it's a drive neutral reverse. It's a gene replacement therapy for a culture. Take out the old DNA, put in the new, right? Take out the old identity. And so they go into the classrooms and they tell the kids negative things about the founding fathers. They took land from India and sold people into slavery. They were chauvinist. The students were repulsed by them. Now you got the kids in a neutral. They're open minded. What are all the beliefs out there? Then you give them your pitch for socialism or LGB or sh Sharia Islam or whatever. And so Europe went through this. It went from a thousand years of Catholic cathedrals, Protestant Reformation, and Jewish neighborhoods to the French Revolution, where it was free sex, anything goes, right? And now Europe's turning into a socialist Sharia Europe with the Mohammed being the number one name for newborns. And yes, the government pays for everyone's education, but it decides what career paths you're going to take. My daughter had a friend, wanted to be a doctor, and he kept passing these tests, but the one professor didn't like him and kept flunking him, and he, he had to go and be an occupational therapist instead of being a doctor. I mean, he... he the government decided for him. So French Revolution. Um, it was an intentional effort to erase the Judeo-Christian influence on French society. Religious monuments destroyed, graves desecrated, religious meetings prohibited, churches closed, Christian schools banned, church education outlawed. Um, they even killed nuns. Right? I wrote a book called Miraculous Milestones, and I go through the history of hospitals. And so you had, you know, the oldest hospital in Europe is the Hotel de U, right next door to Notre Dame Cathedral. And it was run by these nuns, the Sisters of Charity. And well, the government took over health care and was forcing them to give up their beliefs, and they wouldn't. And so they line these nuns up and march them to the guillotine and chop off their heads. They're singing a church song, Psalms 117. And, and then they would chop off another head. And there'd be one less person singing, one less person singing. So finally, there's nobody else singing. And, um, and so... The head of France during this French Revolution is Robespierre. And every day he'd come out with a list of new people to be investigated who were not loyal to the, the takeover of the government. And he would call them, and then they would chop off their heads. He says, lead the people by terror. The basis of popular government during a revolution is terror. Terror is nothing more than swift, severe, and flexible justice. Could you imagine the government intentionally terrorizing its people? And so... Ministers and priests and those who harbored them were executed on sight. And a similar thing happened in Mexico in 1917 with Calles. So there's a rural area. It's a farming area. It's hundreds of miles away from the capital. They think they're safe, called the Vendee. Well, guess what? The federal army shows up and it kills 300,000 men, women, and children that don't want to go along with this new secular government. It's considered the first modern genocide and became a model for every socialist revolution since. You kill off the old order. So that you can do something new, your new liberty, equality, fraternity. And 
Robespierre puts a prostitute in Notre Dame Cathedral, covers her with a sheet, said, this is the goddess of reason, let's worship her. And uh, they didn't want done in the year of the Lord, like our Constitution. So they made 1792 the new year one of the Republic. They didn't want a seven-day week because it went back to the Bible. So they came up with a 10-day week, a decade week. Each day had 10 decimal hours, each hour 100 decimal minutes, each minute 100 decimal seconds. They said 10 was the number of man because you'd count with 10 fingers. So they made every measurement in France divisible by 10. They called it the metric system. Maybe that's why I never really liked the metric system. <laughs> so in France, there's no God. Who decides what's right and wrong? The mob, the state, the collective, the fraternité. And so out of this unstructured chaos, they get a tyrant named Napoleon. Right? So democracies and republics, without the people having individual morals and virtues, turns into lawlessness and chaos, out of which some governor, some tyrant comes around and seizes power. And in France's case, it was Napoleon who put the crown on his own head as emperor. And um, so after Napoleon is conquered and banished, six million people died during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the king of Prussia said, we can't get conquered that easy again. We need to strengthen the state. And so he gets a philosopher named Hegel, who teaches at the University of Berlin. And um, so we'll go through these slides real quick. So we go from Pilgrim Covenant, with a God that you're personally accountable to, to the Age of Enlightenment, Covenant turned into social contract with an impersonal God. Next century turns into the French Revolution, which is social contract with no God, turns into Marxism and socialism, where the state is God. And so Hegel, that teaches at the University of Berlin, and has a student named Karl Marx. Hegel says, the state is God walking on earth. We must worship the state. All the worth which the human being possesses, he possesses only through the state, right? There's no creator, so you don't have any inherent rights. Wrote Rousseau, who wrote the social contract, says, when the state says to a citizen, it is expedient for the state that you should die, he ought to die because his life is a gift made conditionally by the state. So 100 years later in Germany, uh, it's the Nazi Ministry of Justice authorized physicians to end the sufferings of incurable patients. No life still valuable to the state will be wantonly destroyed. And then Pol Pot, Cambodia, Khmer Rouge, the communist government, says to keep you is no benefit, to destroy you is no loss. He kills a third of his country because he considers them not helping him and his state. So Hegel said the state recognizes no authority but its own. It acknowledges no abstract rules of good and bad. Uh, what's an abstract rule of good and bad? You mean like the Ten Commandments? Yeah, there's no God. There's, it's the state that decides what's right and wrong. And it's a power grab. If you help the state get more power, the state thinks that your life is valuable to it. If you challenge the state, the state will use its power to crush you. Eisenhower said, in many lands, the state claims to be the author of human rights. If the state gives rights, it can and inevitably will take away those rights. The founding fathers had to refer to the creator in order to make the revolutionary experiment make sense. In other words, do your rights come from the government or from a source higher than the government? If your rights come from a creator, then the government's purpose is to guarantee and protect to you your creator-given rights. If there is no creator, your rights come from where? The state, the social contract, the fraternity, the club, the collective. And what the state giveth, the state can taketh awayeth. Eisenhower says it was because all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that men could dare to be free. We rebelled against the king because he was infringing on our creator-given rights. Well, um, I'm going to pause, and then when we come back, I'm going to talk about the subtitle of my book, uh, which is how the deep state capitalizes on crises to consolidate control. And did you get anything out of this so far? All right. <laughs>